Chapter 24, Research by Wim Hof. Recently, many articles have been published about the Iceman. The most important discovery that I think is worth talking about is that I'm capable of consciously influencing my immune system. It has been proven at the Feinstein Institute in Manhattan, New York, and now at the hospital in Nijmegen, Netherlands. As you may recall, a few years ago in Manhattan, I performed a meditation experiment at a biochemical research institute. They asked me to meditate at room temperature. The doctors connected me to a lung monitoring system as well as a cardiograph. They stuck a needle in my left arm and withdrew blood before, during, and after the meditation. I had to wait a week before hearing those results. When I received that call from Dr. Kenneth Kamler, I was ecstatic. They found that I was able to suppress the inflammatory bodies influencing the vagus nerve. This means that they found proof that I could directly influence the autonomic nervous system. With this great news, a new fire had started within me. This means that my technique can be a viable way to help cure diseases. The immune system is a powerful source that deals with what makes us sick. If I can do it, so can everyone else. It's just training. Last year, I was invited to the most famous theater hall in Holland by the Circus der Gerachten. They're a platform for innovative thoughts and ideas. They had read one of the articles about my passion to become a dedicated contributor in helping to prevent disease in the world. When I went, I spoke about my interest in finding cures for diseases. The director of the circus had a degree in medicine, and after hearing my speech, we got in contact with the renowned Radboud Hospital in Nijmegen, Netherlands. They organized a meeting with a physiologist named Professor Hopman. Hopman and her team were very interested in performing an experiment on me, so I went with the executives of the circus and drove to Nijmegen. When we arrived at the hospital, I was introduced to many people, including a pleasant Professor Hopman. She escorted me to the laboratory and showed me around. She then introduced me to each member of her research team. Soon after, the tests began. My heart, blood, and veins were all monitored. They also monitored the cold's temperature, as well as my core temperature, lungs, and more. I tried my hardest to give the best possible results. I had wires connected all over my body. Willingly, I entered a Perspex box that they then proceeded to pour ice cubes into. As soon as the ice was up to my neck, the timer began. They checked on me every five minutes, and every 15 minutes, the doctors extracted blood from my veins. The monitors were active, and so was I. Everyone was busy with their particular job, yet everyone was watching me. It felt like I was at the circus again. They all seemed very excited to be experimenting on me. The ice man was sitting in a Perspex box filled with 700 kilograms of ice. I think it was a different experience for them compared to any other experiment they could have been doing that day. They were monitoring an adult male in one of the most extreme situations imaginable. After an hour and a half in ice, I had no problem whatsoever. I was charged up when I came back into the laboratory and it carried on to the end. I gave it my best and I hoped the results would agree. When I was getting out of the ice box, I was struck with regret. I had forgotten to use my breathing technique in the ice. It would have made the results much more significant, but it was too late. So I let it go and hoped that my performance had been enough. Everyone was excited. The room was fuller than when I had first entered. Many more professors and doctors from the university must have come in to witness the event. They sat me down in a chair and the afterdrop began to kick in. They noticed my shivering and asked what I was feeling. I then told them that I'm like everyone else. I can sense both the cold and the heat. The only difference between myself and everyone else is that when I focus, I can withstand the cold much more than the average person. After warming up, they let me return to my home to await the results. A week later, we were back at Radboud sitting in Professor Hopman's office. Seated around a large table, we were given sheets that explained the results. Hopman sounded excited. It seems, she said, that you can influence the autonomic nervous system. You were able to maintain your core body temperature at 37.1 degrees Celsius, 98.78 degrees Fahrenheit. You were able to do this while immersed in the ice for an hour and a half. This has never been done before. She continued while pointing at the large collection of books behind her. We can rewrite all of these books in my office and tell that the autonomic nervous system can be influenced by human will. After catching my breath at hearing the astounding result, I told them that I had always believed it was possible. Despite the disbelief of others, I had always known. There was no longer any speculation. The results were sitting in my hand. I then proceeded to look over the results in full detail. The first thing that I noticed was that my blood pressure remained normal the entire time. Normally, when someone is exposed to extremely cold temperatures, the blood pressure dramatically increases to warm up the body. You can call it the survival mode. My pulse also stayed relatively the same. When exposed to the cold, the pulse has been known to double or even triple the normal resting rate. Then while I was submerged in ice, I was able to triple the oxygen density in my body by 300%. By simply standing there without shivering, I was producing three times more oxygen to warm up the exposed parts of my body. This is not a typical physiological reaction. They found that the activity in each individual cell in my body became hyperactive after immersing in ice. Even a week after they took my blood, they were still able to see the activity in my cells. One of the most significant pieces of data was my skin temperature compared to my core temperature. 
My skin, which was measured by 16 sensors placed at different spots on my body, showed a dramatic decrease in temperature to almost zero degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Despite the decrease in skin temperature, the core temperature, which normally decreases with the skin, remained at the same temperature, 37.1 degrees Celsius, 98.78 degrees Fahrenheit. The carotid artery, which is one of the major arteries that provides blood flow to the head, showed another remarkable result. Typically, when immersed in the cold, the carotid artery's most important job is to provide blood flow to the brain. Apparently, from the observations made in the experiment, I was able to reverse the blood flowing to my head. A likely hypothesis is that since my head wasn't immersed in the cold water, it didn't need to be warmed up. So by telling my warm blood where to go, I was able to direct the blood flow to the core parts of my body that needed it most. Shortly after the results came in, I came in contact with a man by the name of Professor Mihai Natia, an immunologist. Normally, a peaceful and calm man, when Professor Natia heard the results of the experiment, his body leaked with excitement. He then proposed a new type of experiment to me. He told me that there was a method to show how effective immune systems are by injecting the blood with endotoxin. This endotoxin causes the body to react as if it were poison. This poison provokes the immune system to react violently by releasing cytokines into the bloodstream. Usually, someone injected with endotoxin suffers from nausea, fever, headaches, and an overall flu-like state. This experiment is known as the endotoxin experiment. Now I thought, if I can influence the immune system, everybody can. That's my goal. It could change how things work in terms of healthcare for people all around the world. Apart from the talk of the endotoxin experiment, immunologists had already begun subjecting me to other kinds of studies. While lying on a bed, connected to all kinds of monitors to watch for heat, blood pressure, and cellular activity, researchers withdrew blood from me 18 times. After an hour and a half of doing nothing, they had me do another hour and a half of my breathing exercises, inducing my meditative state. They sent the withdrawn blood to six different laboratories to measure different things. One of the labs that received the blood was the endotoxin department. However, they were unable to release the results until the endotoxin experiment took place. They didn't want to influence my state of mind. However, there was a slight problem with the endotoxin experiment. The doctors wanted to inject me with endotoxin, but the ages that are allowed to participate in the experiment have to be between 18 and 35, and I was in my early 50s. Even though I'm strong as an ox, I could not get past this age barrier. The doctors who previously saw the results were anxious to prove that the immune system could be consciously influenced. There was a lot of frustration, but we remained patient and persevered. For what felt like ages, we waited. The Ethical Commission administration needed to clear me before I could participate in the experiment. And then finally, after many days, I received a call that would change the world forever.